Hello, welcome to another episode of Jim's Lama Garden. Okay, so as you can see with the asparagus, the, um, the plants have now gone brown. Um, all the berries are um, ripe, so obviously you could take more seed if you wish to, but I've already done that. Now, you're much better off at this time of year now that the asparagus has gone sort of brown like this. Now all of the goodness has gone back down into the roots um, to feed the roots for next year. So this, this, this top growth now is only going to cause you problems because basically as the winds build over the winter these are going to rock backwards and forwards which is going to potentially damage the root uh, which is obviously the bit that you need to protect with it being a herbaceous plant this basically dies down to the ground and then you know the root survives over the winter then of course in the spring you'll get the spears coming up and that's the part that you eat so basically what you need to do is cut all this top growth off um, an inch or so above the ground um, and you can dispose of all of this now. Um, obviously if you need to save any berries, um, do that. But all you need to do is go down to the bottom of the plant like, like that, where you've got it just coming out of the ground, and just cut that off at about an inch or so uh, above the ground, and then just remove all of this top growth. Um, that can either be composted, shredded or burnt, um, and then um, that will make sure that the, uh, the root stock will, um, you know, sort of be you know sort of protected if you like because if this is if you imagine if you leave that on and this is rocked backwards and forwards like that in the wind um, that will potentially damage the roots so uh, you're much better off getting it off now because there's no more goodness going to go into the roots from the you know, the leaves and that so the uh, best thing you can do at this time of year is cut all that back okay so that's the asparagus taken down I've also taken the fence um, round it down as well because I, I um, you know the uh, the bamboo's best kept inside over the winter, so that's all of the um, top bits taken out. Now, as you can see, I've got a few annual weeds over there. I've got some um, dandelions and something else at the front here. So I'm going to take that out, and uh, what I'm going to do is do a quick um, sort of going over. There's a few um, nasturtium seeds I've noticed on the floor. There was a nasturtium there, so I'm going to take them up, and then I'm just going to put a light dressing of. Um, wood chippings over the top just as a mulch um, and then um, just fix this piece of woody that's come over the posts have gone over on that and then that's the asparagus done for the winter obviously this comfrey here needs to be cut right back down to the ground um, and rather than composting that that can go straight onto the ground obviously you can shred it first but that's going to be um, very rich in um, potassium which is going to be great for anywhere where you grow potatoes and things like that. So I'm going to put that straight onto the uh, where the potatoes are here, where the muck is there. That can all rot down and be dug in um, in the spring. So the comfy will come off very shortly. So that's basically the asparagus done for the, uh, for the winter. Okay, so the way that I do my raspberries, as you can see, these are the... These are the shoots that obviously grew this year. As you can see, there's, there's, there's still green growth on the top. And what I've done is I've cut out all of the, the sort of the old dead ones that fruited this year. And all I've done is I've just gone up the middle. And any that are tied back, which are obviously the ones that were there last year, because I tied them all back last year, I've cut out. So I've gone up so far, you can see there's still these dead ones in the middle. All the new ones are either side. So all I'm doing now is just going off, cutting all the strings with a pair of scissors and then cutting them all off at about sort of three or four inches off the ground and then as soon as I've gone so far what I can do then is tie these new ones back into the um, into the bars um, do it in sections then you won't you know sort of run the chance of damaging the ones uh, the new ones for next year so I'll just do um, up to there and I'll show you what it looks like and basically I just need to carry on that process going up um, to the 
to the other end of this uh, sort of row if you like. So I'll, I'll, I'll just tie these ones back now and I'll show you what that looks like. Okay, a really big tip for when, you, when you're tying things back, what you want to do is get your sort of reel of string. Now you can do this one or two ways, you can either wrap it around a piece of wood or you can wrap it around your hand. But what I tend to do is use this piece of wood here. So start on the end there, basically just wrap the string around the piece of wood like that. And as soon as you've got all the string wrapped around, I'll just do the end of this, this, this uh, roll of string. As soon as you've done that, just get a pair of scissors and put that up inside the, the string like that. And what you'll end up with is loads of pieces of string, just the right length for tying your, your raspberries and uh, various bits and bobs in. Then what you can do, obviously, just take one of those and you can tie your raspberry canes up. OK, so the raspberries should look like that once you've done them. Obviously, what I've done is I've taken out all of the dead um, old canes from the middle and then tied back the um, the new canes like that. Now what you can do, you can leave this like this. this, these are about kind of seven foot high. What you can do is leave them as they are, um, they should be okay during the winter. Or what you can do is sort of cut them down a little bit, um, you know, just in case you're worried about the wind taking them. But to be honest with you, I think we could probably leave these as they are. Um, they do look a little bit neater if you cut them all off at the same height. but um, but I'm going to leave them as they are. Now, obviously, as you know, um, raspberries will always fruit on the um, last year's wood. So obviously, this is the these are the canes that have grown up this year because of the because of the weather that we've had, we have already had some fruit on uh, because they were you know they sort of the, 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 the fruited in the autumn. Um, but because I know that this is a um, spring or summer type variety, I know that this is doubly fruited now. Um, these canes will fruit again in the spring, so what I've done obviously is taken out all the old ones and then the new ones I've tied back into the into the framework. So all I need to do now is go along in exactly the same way. You pull out you pull out all the new canes like that. I mean there's even raspberries still on. Look, I mean we're in De December almost and there's a raspberry on there. Um, that's the mold, mold year we've had. So all I do is I go along. All of these old, it's quite obvious at this time of year because obviously all the old ones will have like the silver silver kind of look to them. So you don't, all you need to do is cut off the strings, cut them off at the bottom, at about sort of two or three inches off the top as I say, take all the middle bit out and then all these new ones, pull them back and then tie them in, um, work your way along the row. What I suggest you do is do it in sections, um, so you know do, I don't know, four, four or five foot, clear all the old ones out, tie the new ones back and then carry on so you don't run the damage of, um, the, the danger of damaging any of the, uh, the new canes. And then work your way along until you got to the end and then that's your raspberries ready um, for next spring. Again, with the raspberries, this is the ideal time of year to um, put some mulch at the bottom, some, some well-rotted um, chicken manure or something like that is ideal. Just put that along the bottom, um, around the roots, and then that will feed the plants for next year. Okay, so you can see with this bit of frost that we've had um, over the past couple of days, the, uh, the birdhouse gourd plants have really died back now. Now it's time, most certainly, to take the, uh, the gourds off, otherwise the gourds will start to look like, like this one as here. So all I'm going to do, a pair of secateurs, just cut the gourd off so you've got around two inches of stalk like that, um, and then put the, put the gourd either in a, in a shed or in the greenhouse, ideally in the sunshine. Um, just to ripen off a little bit more and um, s start to dry it because basically what you want to do now is to get these to dry out. Now I've seen various um, people just leaving these on the ground over the winter and uh, letting them kind of naturally dry out in the winter but uh, in, the, in the British um, environment I think because of the, you know, the amount of water and rain that we get um, snow and that's over the uh, the winter months. I think you're much better off cutting these off the plant and either putting them in your greenhouse um, or in the um, the shed. It doesn't have to be a frost-free environment. All it needs to be is uh, you know sort of dry. Let them dry out. The, you will start to get mould forming around the um, the outside. That's that's a natural part of the drying process. And then uh, come the come the uh, the spring, they should be dry enough to uh, to carve into a birdhouse. Okay, so as you can see, the yakon plants, they're all starting to die down now. 
Um, and this is not going to put any goodness into the, uh, the roots. All it's going to do is start to sort of fall over like this. Now, I've had these tied up for a couple of months now. Um, so it's really time to sort of take the top off. And all you need to do, obviously we're lifting the rhizomes before too much longer. And the, uh, the crowns, this is a crown here. Uh, rhizomes will be underneath or the tuber. So all I'm going to do is basically cut cut the uh, um, it's off sort of, I don't know, four or six inches above the ground um, and then I'll dispose of the top and then I'll dig these up as soon as you've had a reasonably good frost. Okay, so the other day I thought it was about time I did a comment section and I was quite surprised when I looked back through my notes that um, it's been um, the, the last one I did was actually in June, so I can only apologise for not getting around to doing this before now. With everything that's been going on, putting up the other greenhouse and you know various other things that I've had to do, um, I've not got around to going through the comments. Now, what I will say before we go any further is thank you to everybody who's left comments on the video channel. I always do read them on a regular basis every few days. I will go in there and read anything. If there are any specific questions that are put in there, I will always put an answer. Um, but what I typically do is if it's a more general question or sort of comment, what I will do is sort of bring it up in, in one of these comment sections. So I do apologise if I've not got back to you, uh, but I will always eventually get back to you. So I can only apologise that it's taken this long for me to sort out everything and sort of get around to doing the comments. So um, I'm, I'm going to go back to June and August, uh, sorry, July and August now. Um, and just do the comments that were left on there and then uh, what I will do is in the next couple of videos I'll catch up through um, September, October, November and December so um, y you know I'll, I'll, I'll sort of go through the comments but I didn't want to do too much in one go otherwise you know, we, you know we'd be here forever so the first comment comes from a number of people um, mainly um, from, from Alex um, um, grow and tell and this was all about the moths that I found um, now I've it, it's, it's been one of them years this year where we've had moths eating things that I've, I've not seen before I've had moths eating um, tomato plants which I've never seen before or sort of caterpillars eating um, uh, the tomato plants which I found a couple of um, um, caterpillars in here quite large green ones and I've also had caterpillars eating the, uh, the, uh, the rhubarb which I've never seen before in the past as well and there's been quite a few people um, added comments on here so thank you very much um, the, the, who've added comments so we've had Alex from Grow and Tell we've had uh, Be Beowulf1 we've had uh, Mag H and we've also had um, Gaunt742 and also um, Barry Ashford and we've had um, Deborah Shannon so thank you to everybody um, who's, who's left comments on this but basically what we've got is um, Alex was saying from, from Grow and Tell that he's had caterpillars eating all sorts of things. So he's been eating his tomatoes, his potatoes, his peas, um, sweet corn, beets, um, and, and this is basically the caterpillar off a moth. Um, and he was saying that it's a tomato horn moth or a hummingbird um, hawk moth. Um, now, these weren't found in the UK up until recently, in the last couple of years. Um, and basically, um, they're quite large caterpillars and they'll eat pretty much anything to be honest with you. Uh, you know, they'll eat sort of plants such as sort of toxic and things like that. Um, and um, basically he was saying that um, he has seen them in his, his tunnel and it was quite a large moth that came out of it after the sort of the chrysalis had, um, you know, sort of changed and come out as a moth. Um, so he said he's, he's also seen them in the UK. Now I understand there's also another one... Um, that, that um, was detailed by, um, I think it was Deborah where she was saying that um, there's also another moth, um, just sort of going through the notes here, um, that was from Japan. Um, I'll perhaps come to that in a minute. But basically, she was saying if you if you see um, uh, the caterpillar, if you see the caterpillars, obviously kill them. If um, if you see the caterpillar with little white eggs on it, now this is a parasitic wasp. Um, which actually lays eggs on top of the uh, the caterpillar, which will obviously kill them. And this is obviously a natural sort of predator for the moths. So obviously, if you do find a, a caterpillar with these parasitic wasp eggs on there, leave it, don't kill it, because obviously you want these parasitic moths to kill the rest of the um, caterpillars if they do come. So um, thank you for all of your comments on that. I did do a comment in June on, on, on that one, but I just thought I'd sort of quickly round off with that. The next comment was from... Um, Christine um, Whiteacre um, and she was asking about cucumbers, which cucumbers I grow. Now 
cucumbers. There's quite a few varieties of cucumbers out there. You know, there's there's there's, there's some from sort of um, sort of round, short ones, and you know, and then the you know the more traditional sort of longer ones. Um, you know, there's a whole variety of ones. Now, I always I always grow um, a variety called female F1. The reason being is is it's completely female, so you don't get male and female flowers on there. The problem that you get if you've got cucumbers with male and female flowers on, if the if the fruits become um, pollinated, they'll they'll turn really large and bitter and not very nice to eat. The, the good thing about the female um, F1 hybrids is they're only female, so you don't need to worry about taking off the male flowers. You can just leave them, and then you know you know whatever grows, um, you know you can just leave it be, and then you don't need to worry about taking the male flowers off. So every flower that's on there is obviously female, and then that will turn to a fruit. So basically, that's what I always grow. I did grow another variety this year, which was a um, it was basically um, grafted onto a rootstock, and uh, they did reasonably well. But uh, to be honest with you, I think um, the best cucumbers I've found is female F1. That's always the one I go for. I do experiment with various other ones, but that's the one I'd go for if I was recommending one. Um, Brian Allotment Life also said um, the Reed had cucumbers. He'd been on holiday, and some of the leaves on his cucumbers have gone yellow now. Cucumbers are really hungry plants, so what you need to do is keep them well watered and fertilised. Uh, you know, you need to keep, you know, sort of plenty of goodness in there, obviously. Put your comfort juice in there, and also um, uh, potassium is another um, thing that you need to sort of keep on top of with uh, cucumbers. As long, as long as you give them plenty of those things, they should be okay. But obviously keep them watered, um, keep them well fertilised, obviously um, comfort juice or, or, or anything that's high in potassium will be good. Then also um, the um, I always put Epsom salts in the water every couple of weeks as well which again is, is, is high in potassium which which will should prevent the leaves from going yellow. Now this year I didn't have a brilliant year for cucumbers. I typically get about 12, between 12 and 15 cucumbers per plant. Um, now this year I've probably averaged about nine cucumbers per plant so it's you know it has been um, a lot less than I would do normally. Um, and I can only put that down to the, the, the fact that I changed the position from there to there because cucumbers don't like you know too much bright light on them because uh, the, the cucumbers that I grew in the other greenhouse which is darker um, tended to do better um, and also I've grown them in pots now if you grow them in pots that's really good against um, um, them, them, them damping off because cucumbers have got this really bad habit of damping off at the bottom so basically where the stalk comes through the ground uh, if you get water sitting around that area there it'll it'll rot the bottom of the, um, the stalk off and then obviously the plant will die so if you grow them in um, pots and water from the bottom like I did this year over there um, that kind of gets around that problem but having said that um, I don't think the plants grew with particularly good vigour this year um, Normally, when I grow them over this side, they grow quite quickly and they go straight up the greenhouse and they're typically down the other side. This year, they only kind of got half as long as they normally do, and I've got about half the fruit that I normally do. So I don't think they grew particularly well there this year. Next year, I plan to grow cucumbers in the other greenhouse. I'm going to have a go at growing them directly in the ground. I'm going to sweep the ground up with lots of chicken manure, well rotted chicken manure, and I'm also going to put in lots of um, grass to keep the ground nice and warm, because as that breaks down, it, grass always breaks down quickly, and when it breaks down, um, the um, the bacteria basically warm the ground up, and that should give them a really good start, and I'm going to get them growing in the other greenhouse like that. So that's that's one of the plans for the other greenhouse next year, so I'm going to grow them in there. They will get plenty of light in there, but I'm also going to grow them in the other greenhouse, which is darker, and then I can do a better comparison there um, next year. So, But, but with, with cucumbers, if you do find that the, that the leaves go yellow, it's because the plant is stressed. <clears throat> and it can be one of three things. Too much sunlight, so the, the, it's actually bleaching the, um, the leaves. Not enough potassium or basically other nutrients or water it's lacking. So make sure that they've got plenty of water. Um, make sure they've got uh, sort of plenty of potassium and other, you know, the other um, elements that they need. And then also, um, you know, make sure they're not in too much direct, direct sunlight and they should, they should flourish okay. Um, the next one um, comes from uh, Grow Roots and they were asking me about what I feed the chickens on. Now my chickens have a standard um, egg layers um, food mix um, and that's important that you, 
that you do give them some um, food mix, you know, for chickens because you've got calcium in there which, which goes to form the, uh, the eggshells. So that's quite important. So you can feed your chickens a whole manner of things really. I would avoid giving them any, any kind of, um, most certainly any kind of meat products. Don't give them any kind of meat products at all. Um, and don't give them the eggs as well. You know, any eggs that you get in um, from the chickens, don't don't give the shells back or anything like that. That's um, that, that that's not to be done. But any vegetable matter off the allotment that you're not going to eat yourself, any brassicas, spinach, um, or or sort of anything like that, give them the chickens. Uh, the one thing that I do give the chickens a lot of is chickweed. Now, this is a weed. I'm just trying to see if there's any in here. Um, chickweed's like a um, a weed that grows really well on my allotment and it's got small small leaves on it, I can actually see some out the window there and it grows all year round so when I'm weeding what I do is I typically put all of the the weeds that that are, are, are no good for giving the chickens um, into the bin and then any weeds that the chickens are, I know will eat, things like um, dandelions they'll eat, um, things like chickweed they'll eat um, any, anything like that, what I tend to do is put that in a separate bucket and I give that to the chickens and then they'll, they'll scratch through that and eat it. Um, another thing obviously that I give the chickens are, um, I give them mixed corn, which is which is bought. Um, that's very good in, in um, vitamins and stuff like that. But off the allotment, the chickens do eat a lot of the um, plants that basically um, are not going to be used by me. So any gourds, pumpkins or anything like that, or... or um, um, any any pumpkins that are um, not quite right, or um, any um, courgettes that are um, you know sort of gone over, um, anything like that, I give to the chickens. Tomatoes that aren't aren't quite right, um, that I'm not going to use myself, I give those to the chickens as well. The chickens have a lot of fruit, um, things like uh, windfall apples. I give them to the chickens; they eat all of those. Um, and then any brassica, literally any brassica at all. That um, that's not going to be eaten. So if you're if you're um, picking um, kale or or, or or something like that, or, or sprouts or whatever, the rest of the plant when you're finished with it, give that to the chickens as well. So any brassicas that are taken out of the ground, the root stock always goes into the bin because because of club root. I don't want to put that back into the ground in any way, shape, or form. So I don't want to compost that or or even give it to the chickens. So what I'll always do is when I've finished with a particular brassica plant. I'll take the brassica out with a pair of um, secateurs, I'll cut off the root and some of the stalk, put that into the recycling and get rid of that, and then the rest of it will basically go into the chicken coop and then the chickens will eat all the leaves and stuff like that, and then the rest of it goes into the compost heap to be composted for compost for the garden. Um, anything like carrot tops, um, they'll eat, anything, any, any herb at all, so things like your um, mint or oregano or sage or, or anything like that, the potato uh, the goes to the chickens. Um, any any fruit, as I say, raspberries, strawberries, anything like that, which isn't quite, you know, you're not going to eat yourself, give them to the chickens, they'll thank you for those. Um, cucumbers I've given the chickens before now. Um, I've also given them um, potatoes, obviously they need to be cooked. So any leftover potatoes from the from the kitchen that's cooked, give that to the chickens as well. Any rice that's over from a meal, uh, the chickens have that. It's obviously not fried, boiled rice. Um, and then um, don't give the chickens anything like rhubarb or anything like that, or at least I'd avoid doing that. But as I say, any brassica, because if you've got a swede, also you're going to eat the swede itself, the top off the swede, give that to the um, give that to the uh, the chickens as well. So they'll you know they'll thank you for anything like that. Um, but but more but more particularly sort of any weeds and that that you, that you get off the allotment, particularly chickweed, which grows really well on my allotment. That you know the chickens will eat that. But be careful what you give them. Don't give them anything like dock leaves or nettles or even I suppose they could eat nettles. Uh, but don't give them anything like um, you know anything that's potentially sort of harmful for them. Things like um, I'll tell you something else that I give them quite often as well um, is nasturtiums. Uh, now, obviously, anything that we can eat, pretty much a chicken will be able to eat. So things like nasturtiums, the leaves and the flowers, the chickens will eat those. Um, and if you give your chickens a good variety of food, um, obviously that will, you know, sort of keep them healthy. Anything that's fresh is obviously full of vitamins and stuff like that. The, 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 uh, the healthier you keep your chickens, the longer they'll live and the better the quality of the eggs you're going to get from them. So it's a win-win situation. You're only going to throw it in the, in the compost if you don't use it yourself, so you may as well give it your chickens. Um, you know, it basically doesn't cost anything. The other thing is as well, obviously um, some flowers, um, they, they go to the chickens as well. I'll save a number of seeds, but this head here that's been drying out, 
um, that's been drying out in the greenhouse now for some time. That will go to the chickens, um, that will be hung up in the chicken coop along with the others. Um, and the, the, the chickens will eat the way through that in the winter. What I do try and do is keep some of the sunflower heads a bit later on so that as things start to finish in the greenhouse, uh, it's already in the allotment, you know, there's other things I can give them as well to try and keep them, you know, the, you know, the sort of things they've got going if you like. But uh, pretty much with chickens you can give them anything. I'd avoid giving them any kind of meat product. Uh, don't give them any meat or any fish or anything like that. Don't give them anything that's too spicy, but apart from that, any vegetable matter um, obviously, but if it's a potato or something like that, it needs to be cooked. Um, you know, you, you're okay to give to your chickens, in, in my opinion. Okay, um, the next one comes from um, Ophelia's allotment, and she said, "How many runner bean plants did you grow?" The simple answer to that is too many. Uh, this year, I I grew, I think it was about 180 plants. Some of them were to give away to friends and family, but I ended up putting into the allotment probably around 100. 30, 140 plants, and I had far too many um, bean plants to be honest with you. Um, next year, I'll almost certainly be growing less run of bean plants. This year was a bumper year for them. I got an amazing amount of um, run of beans. I think I had something like 56 kilos put into the freezer, and also I was eating, I was, you know, chopping them up and eating them as they were fresh as well. So uh, we've probably eaten probably about 60 kilos of run of beans off the um, the allotment this year and probably about 30 or 40 kilos of, of um, went, went to waste as well. Okay the next one comes from um, Singrid Rupert, uh, Robert um, and she said why did the um, hollyhocks um, that, that should have been black and white? I'm not sure I had that problem because the um, I, I did have white hollyhocks there before. I've, I've put black in the front garden which is the first time they've ever been in there um, and they all come out black the ones that have come out here were white, and I think that's quite possibly a plant that was there before. So I don't believe I've had a black one come out white, however some of the seed could have got mixed up. So um, that's, that's all I can say about that. I'm not sure if the black plant came out white, but I had white hollyhocks there before now, so I think that's possibly white. Uh, next one comes from Gord742, and he was saying rhubarb leaves eaten by Japanese beetle. This was the one I was talking about earlier. And, uh, and it's, um, the Japanese beetle is... Uh, Polylia um, japonica, which I think is basically just means Japanese beetle, uh, and and he was saying that that was introduced to the um, country a couple of years ago, and it's known to eat toxic leaves. So the rhubarb leaves that were eaten earlier in the year, I don't know if you remember, um, that's likely to be a Japanese beetle that's done that. Um, and John King um, put a comment to say um, thanks for the comment about removing green chilies off the plant um, um, to ripen. Um, the, and this comment was all about, the thing with any plant really, it's, its whole purpose in life is to grow its to flower, grow its fruit and then, and then to die. If you keep pulling fruit off a plant, the plant will keep trying to grow more fruit. So if you want to maximise out on, on, on any sort of tomato plant or, or, or sort of chilli plant or, or, or pepper plant or anything like that, the more fruit you take off it, the more fruit it will create. Because um, basically what you want to do is... Take the fruit off just as it's starting to ripen and then the plant will think, oh I've lost that fruit, something's eaten it or whatever, I need to grow more. So if you want to get the most amount out of any type of plant like that, tomato, chilli or anything like that, um, if you take the, the fruits off before they've fully ripened, the plant will create more and more fruit. So, you know, that's the best way to do it. And also, chilies will ripen quite nicely off the plant as well. So you can just take them, cut, cut them off the plant, and then leave them on a windowsill or, you know, in the sunlight, and they will and they will ripen off quite nicely. So you get more out of your chilli plant for that. Um, Jason Smith um, put the comments about how many weeds we've had this year. Now, uh, I think we've had a record year for weeds this year. I mean, the, the, the potato... Um, patch. I ended up weeding about five times this year uh, and I don't think I've ever done that before. I think typically three three times, possibly four times I'll go through and give it a really good weed and then you don't see any more weeds for the rest of the year. Particularly with the onions and the, the parsnips as well. Um, I, I just seem to be never ending sort of weeding on that. I'd sort of weed them out and then two weeks later there was loads more weeds there and I think it's the because of the weather we've had this year uh, we had quite a dry spring and summer, it's quite warm, um, and then we've had the odd bit of rain here and there. I think it was an ideal situation for weeds to grow, and I just think that's why they've all grown. 
So uh, yes, we have had loads, a load more weeds than we do normally. Um, Deborah Shannon from the US has um, commented on a few things. Thank you, Deborah, for your comments. First one was the Don Pedro planter um, plant that I showed you earlier in the year. Um, she believes that this is called the four o'clock plant in the US. So you may well note that if you're from that part of the world. Um, she also talked about um, going back to the um, caterpillars. Um, she was saying that there's a there's a bacteria that naturally occurs in the ground called um, Baculus thuringiensis. I think that's how you pronounce it anyway, or BT for short. Um, and this can be sprayed on. It's naturally occurring, so it's not harmful to anything. You can spray this on um, caterpillars, and it'll kill them off. And obviously, it'll you know it won't damage your plants, and it won't be harmful to anybody else other than caterpillars. So uh, that uh, might be worthwhile uh, looking at for. So that's. Baculus, B A C I W L U S, um, and then Thoring Ienius, say you pronounce it, T H U R I N G I E N S I S. Um, so if you want to look out for that, that's possibly something you could use for controlling caterpillars. Um, the other thing that she was saying about um, to stop slugs going onto pepper plants and that is there's also a, um, a substance you can put on the top of the earth. Uh, that, that, that you plant your um, pepper plants in, and that's called diatom um, aceus. Diatom aceus. I, I, I'm assuming that's the way you pronounce it anyway. Um, and this, you can put this on top of the ground, and slugs don't like it, so as they crawl across it, um, they basically don't like it. And she was also talking about a variety of um, pepper that she's been um, growing this year, and it's called Sunnybrook, and it's a pepper I think that came from Wales um, originally. And it's a pepper specifically for short um, season. So obviously in, in the UK we get not a particularly short season, but but our season is a little bit shorter than other parts of the world. Um, and she said that's a really good, um, it, it's a sheep nose variety, um, and it um, basically grows quite quickly in a, you know, in a short amount of time, so that might be worth one. So that's called Sunny Brook. Um, Karen um, Bibby also um, put a comment on about um, she was having a problem with young butternut squashes um, and she's saying that the, the, the butternut squash would start and then it would basically drop off. It's going to be one of a few things that could possibly cause this. Um, butternut squashes um, can be bad uh, pollination. Now what I tend to do, obviously I grow a lot of um, calendulas and things like that. The reason for this, apart from the fact that they're pretty and you know they look nice and stuff like that, they attract insects into the allotment and this is quite important. Um, so I have a lot of plants dotted around the allotment, uh, things like the sunflowers, the um, calanges and things like that, and these are all well known for bringing in insects into the, and rosemary and stuff like that, these are all well known for bringing insects in, and if you haven't got many insects by you, this could be a possible reason. So if you've not got many insects, obviously try to encourage them in by putting flowers amongst your butternut squashes, or what you can do is pollinate yourself. Take the male flower off, the male flower is going to be the one with the long, thin stalk behind it. And then basically take off the petal so you just ended up with the middle part of the flower. And then push that inside the, the female flowers, which are going to have the shorter stems on them. And then that will basically pollinate and then you should get better pollination. That's possibly one cause. The other causes could be the, the plant is stressed, so in other words it's not got water. Um, or, the, or the soil prep's not right. Possibly the variety is not good for you. Um, or possibly get some self-pollinating, uh, and I've also put put calanges around them as well. Now, with squashes um, and um, pumpkins, anything like that, um, ground prep is is the golden rule. If you can get the ground right, you can pretty much leave them for the rest of the year. So what I suggest you do is is where you're going to plant your um, your your gourds, so your squashes or your pumpkins or wherever else. Dig as much organic material into the ground as you possibly can do and go down reasonably deep, go down about 18 inches and dig in as much, anything you can get your hands on, muck, grass, um, manure, composted ground, and anything that you could possibly find, stick it into the ground and dig it all in. Um, the more you put in there the better because what you want to do is you want to hold moisture in the ground as much as possible and also what you want to do is put as much nutrients in the ground as, as possible as well. If you can get the ground as fertile as you possibly can get it and as much carbon matter in there as well which is going to hold the water, anything like straw or um, you know grass cuttings, anything like that will all hold the moisture in the ground. 
and then when you put your um, your gourds in there, your button squashes or your pumpkins or wherever else, all of that nutrient is in there. You won't need to water them as much because the water is going to be there. And then the plant will get away and then and it'll have all the nutrients there that it'll need to grow. And the plant won't be stressed and therefore it won't be dropping its fruit and stuff. So that could be another reason why. Now, I found, and I don't know if, uh, and, I, and I know we've had comments off other people as well. Um, there was there was one from um, um, Jacko's allotment as well. Um, I found that with um, butternut squashes, pumpkins and stuff like that, um, if you plant them and leave them alone, they tend to grow really well. They, they, they don't tend to like to be nurtured too much. Um, the, the guy who's got the allotment next to me, he literally planted a, a pumpkin last year. He planted one pumpkin plant and the pumpkin plant ended up being massive. He didn't water it or anything in the year. He just literally planted the plant and left it alone. And he had one massive pumpkin that was that was huge. I watered mine pretty much every other day and I put fertiliser on it and all sorts and my pumpkins were nowhere near as big as this and it was the same variety. So that just goes to show don't nurture um, gourds too much because I don't think they like it so much. You're much better off spending the time getting the ground right in the first place because um, any, any crop it's all about the ground. Um, if you can get the ground right the plant will be away and you can pretty much leave it to it. So if you can get as much nutrients into the ground as you possibly can do any manure, compost, um, as much carbon matter as you can, even if you're just putting in there sort of rotted down cardboard or paper or anything like that, which is going to hold the moisture in the ground, and then get in, in, in there as much organic material as you possibly can do to give you um, all the nutrients and that that you need in there, and then plant your plant your um, gourd plant in there, and it should grow away really well, and you should be able to just leave it for the rest of the year and just watch it grow. That's the best advice I can give you, because I've found with, with gourds, the more you faff around them, the less they likely to do well. Um, and the last comment um, comes from um, um, Fanster Farm um, Greenhouse, or Fenster Farm Greenhouse, should I say, talking about um, uh, tomatoes, and I was saying how well the money maker had done on this side, compared to the Alicante that over on this side, and I had got money makers on this side that did well as well. Um, with, I mean, tomatoes, there's got to be, there's, there's something like 4,000 varieties of tomatoes out there and there's 700 species out there. And there are certain um, varieties of tomatoes that never seem to leave the shelf. Moneymaker is one of them. Now, to the best of my knowledge, Moneymaker, as a variety, is at least 100 years old. Um, you know, it's been it's been grown every year. You know, and it, it, it's it's a well known variety. I have had comments in the past um, to say that money is not particularly tasty tomato, but I've always found it quite nice. Um, and a lot of people say they prefer Alicante, but Alicante is actually derived from uh, money maker. If you look through the family tree, Alicante was actually bred from money maker, and if you compare the two plants, they're almost identical. Flavour-wise, for me, they're almost identical. There's, there's, there's literally nothing in it. So, for me, Money Maker is a surefire bet. If you're only going to grow one variety of tomato, I would strongly, strongly recommend Grow Money Maker because they're easy to grow. They're heavy croppers. You get nice-sized tomatoes. Um, you know, they're, you know, they're not sort of too big and they're not too small. They're nice sort of sized tomatoes like that. Uh, just a bit bigger than a golf ball that big and they're even fruiting in December um, and for for me Moneymaker every year never fails you know I've, I've grown Moneymaker now for at least 20 years and I've never had a bad year with with, uh, with Moneymaker it comes highly recommended they're easy to grow the germination is almost 100% if you put if you put 100 seeds in you're pretty much guaranteed to get 100 plants you plant them they grow away they're, they're reasonably resistant against blight they, they can be grown inside and outside, um, as I say, they're, they're, they're heavy croppers and they're nice sized tomatoes. I, I like the flavour of these, um, you know, I have had some comments where other people have said they don't find them too, um, too flavourful. But I always find with tomatoes as well, is you can very strongly, if you look after the plants and you give them all that they need, I think that improves the flavour of them as well. So I always put lots of comfrey and I always put lots of muck and that in the ground, so I think that, that goes to help the flavour as well. But um, for me, Moneymaker is the the tomato to grow in the UK. I obviously always grow three, sort of two, three, four varieties. I always try and grow, like last year I grew F1 
uh, Rainbow F1. I also typically grow uh, Garner's Delight, which is a which is a cherry tomato, and of course Alicante as well. But for me, if I was to choose one tomato that I was going to grow in a year, it would always, always be Moneymaker. So, I hope this episode was of some use to you. Please don't hesitate to put any comments or questions you've got below and I'll always get back to you. And I'll see you on the next episode of Jim's on the Garden.